you would, please turn to Romans chapter 12. Uh, Romans chapter 12 is where we're going to be at this morning, although I guess I'm going to start reading uh, in 1133, uh, just kind of as a lead up into Romans chapter 12. We don't have the time this morning, uh, the, the time is this evening to talk about the field, but I would like to introduce my family. Uh, my wife, Lisa, is here along with my daughter, Michaela, and uh, we have two other children, uh, Steele, who is 17, and uh, he had some medical issues, and so he had to move in with grandma and grandpa while he is able to get into some specialists. Um, and he's in Colorado, and then we have a 20-year-old who is on her own living in Big Spring and a granddaughter. So um, that's just a little bit about our family, and I would like to plug to come back tonight where you'll actually get to hear about how God took somebody who grew up an atheist and convincing people to leave the faith to then go to uh, the mission field. So if you would, um, Romans 11, verse 33. Of the depth of the riches, both of the knowledge and, sorry, the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever and ever. Sorry, just forever. (laughs) Amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let's pray. Lord, as we come here this morning and uh, we uh, get to study your word and to hear what you have to say to us through it, I ask, Lord, that you would speak through me. That, Lord, it would not be my words, my thoughts, but, Lord, it would be your words and your thoughts. And, Lord, that you would do what I cannot do and that you would be touching hearts and that you would be convincing people of truth. And, Lord, that uh, I would just be your vessel this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have any of you ever felt like you deserve something? My guess is everybody in here has felt like they've deserved something in their life. I uh, know specifically for me, there, I, when I think of deserving things, I think of um, before we started on deputation, I happened to be really cheap. And so I don't like going out to eat because I don't like spending the money. But we would go out a few times a year to go out and eat. And um, I used to go and I would get either a burger or a steak. And I don't really care how you like yours cooked. I like mine rare. And so I would tell them how I wanted to cook, and they would say, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll make it. And then Lisa would get something that was medium rare, and uh, about 90, 95% of the time, hers would be less cooked than mine. And I kind of thought, well, if I'm paying you to make this for me, I deserve you to make it the way I want it. Um, Another way I felt like I've deserved things is that um, before we went on deputation, I had a 16-foot enclosed trailer and a three-quarter ton long bed truck. You know what that makes you? The best friend of anybody wanting to move something. (laughs) And I I help some people move things. I really have no problem with that. My problem comes when I need a hand one day and all of a sudden people's phones don't work. Because, you know, if I scratch their back, they're going to scratch mine. I deserve that kind of reciprocity. Or anybody who's a parent knows that they give up a lot of things for their children. Not that, you know, your life ends and stops, but there are hobbies that I wanted to have. There are goals that I'd had with my life that once I had a family that changed. And I give up all this. And I, I had this grand notion that once my kids became old enough, I'd be able to go do those things with them. And it turns out that they have different thoughts. And that they're not really any different than I was when I was a teenager. And um, I just thought, hey, I give up all this. I, I deserve to have that in response. But we're not talking today about what you deserve for the things that you do what you deserve from your children for what you gave up for them, but what your heavenly father deserves from you for what he has done. 
as we come here into Romans chapter 12, Paul makes a pretty big ask. He says that you should present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's no small thing. When, when you think of what a sacrifice is, usually we think of you know, the Hebrews coming and maybe they have a lamb that they bring to sacrifice to God and they, they bring it to the altar and, and give that to God. And what they're doing is saying, hey, this was mine, but because of all you've done for me and to show you thanks and gratitude, I am giving this to you. And at that point, it is no longer the person who brought it, but it then belongs to God. It would be pretty weird if an Israelite came up with a lamb, brought it to the altar, and then they start talking to the Levites about, well, I know the best way to, to treat this. And then, here, let me come back to the kitchen to help you cook it because I just know the exact right way to, to deal with my lambs. And that would be weird because they would still be trying to control things, trying to tell other people how to do things with it when what they were supposed to do is give it to God and let it go. But beyond just being a sacrifice, which in some ways would be easier just to one time you sacrifice dead, you are to be a living sacrifice. See, if they were going to bring that lamb to the altar and put it there and it stayed living, it wouldn't stay on that altar very long. But we are called to be that living sacrifice, deciding constantly to stay on the altar being given to God. You can think of a living sacrifice, um, it, Hannah in the Old Testament gave up her son Samuel as a living sacrifice. She gave him to God and he spent all of his time just serving God in the temple. She no longer had that authority and control in his life. She was able to visit him once a year and bring him a change of clothes, but she didn't have that presence and that control in the life of her son that I know that she must have wished she had. But she gave that up to God as a living sacrifice. But beyond just being a living sacrifice, he, he says, don't just come as you are, but that you are to be holy. A holy sacrifice and while we're not going to cover everything that holy means in this time, uh, there are books written on the topic of holy, and yet for some reason we still don't quite understand what, what being holy means. It's, it's a word with a lot of depth, and we hear that being holy is to be set apart, and, and that's true, but it's not just being set apart. It's being set apart for the purposes of worshiping and praising God. So here you are to be a living sacrifice set apart to the purpose of worshiping and praising God. And beyond that, you're also to be acceptable. That doesn't mean just come as you are and God gets whatever you happen to be, but that you are supposed to order your life the way that God wants it ordered and do everything the way he wants it done and to put him first because you are to be acceptable to God. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but as we hear about that explanation of what it is that Paul is telling the church at Rome that they should be doing, I'm not looking for the sign-up sheet in the back. It's not like, oh, hey, that sounds real fun. Let's go ahead and look for that. But Paul doesn't just do this and expect or tell other people to do this without doing it himself. In Galatians 2.20, he said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In 1 Corinthians 15.31, he writes, I protest by rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. It's not something he just wants other people to do, and he does not do himself. But here's where I want to get to today. He says that this biggest thing, this is not you know the small thing, but I would even suggest that this is the biggest thing that you could ask from somebody to give up their life, all control of their life to someone else. And yet he says it is your reasonable service. The word reasonable, I thought, well, maybe it means something different in the Greek. <laughs> no, it means according to logic. 
Kind of sounds like reasonable. It's according to logic that you would give up your life a living sacrifice. We're going to look today at what makes that so reasonable. But before we do, I want to point one thing out. There are a lot of promises in the Bible about, hey, you do this and God will do this for you. That you know, most famous would be the first commandment with promise that if you honor your father and your mother, that it will be well with you on the earth and God will bless you, right? If you honor your parents, God will bless you. That is uh, a promise made by God. Or, or maybe Malachi uh, 3.10, that if you bring your tithes to church and you give to God, that God will give back to you so that there will not even be room enough to receive it. Those are promises that if you fulfill your end, God will fulfill his end. This is not that. This is God has already done for you, and therefore you should. He deserves, based on what he has already done from you, that you would present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. So what could possibly he have done to make it reasonable for you to give up yourself, which in the Western culture and in the individualistic society that we have today sounds like the worst thing you could possibly do? Well, we're going to go over a few of them, and I'm sure that uh, we could go for longer, but there is a time limit to preaching and people's attention. Um, but I'm going to start with he has created you. Beyond just creating you, he has created all things. In John 1, 1 through 3, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. There would be no existence without God. There would be no chance for you to have any joy any, any love, any peace, any contentment and fulfillment in your life if God had not created us all in the first place. I grew up an atheist, and I had a really hard time dealing with the evidence that we must have been created. That you can't look at this world that we live in and, and, and say, hey, it could possibly have happened by chance. Yeah. And so this last fall, I was really struck by an article that I, I just saw the headline for it to, to click on it. And it said, the uh, scientists have come up with a new law of nature. And I thought that's a little weird at this point. <laughs> And, and it caught my attention, and, and I was getting my PhD in physics when I got saved, and, and so I, I wanted to read into this. And when I read what the new law was, I was really taken aback, because this new law said that um, there was a law of increasing information. Now, if anybody has ever taken high school physics, you know the second law of thermodynamics, that all things tend towards chaos. Yeah, that's considered the most unimpeachable law of all of physical laws, that if you come up against the second law of thermodynamics, turn around because you went the wrong direction. And yet here they are saying there's a law of increasing information that goes directly against the second law of thermodynamics, and I'm just like, why? So I kept reading on the article, and basically this is what they said. We shouldn't be here, and we know it. And because I reject God is the reason there has to be another law to say why we are here. Without God creating all things, you would not even exist in the first place. And as an atheist, I rejected God mainly because I didn't want to, there to be a Lord over my life. And I knew if there was a God who created all things that he had the right to be the Lord over my life. Without knowing it, I agreed with the four and twenty elders in Revelation 4.20 when they said, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Amen. As far as I'm concerned, the fact that he has created you and you owe your existence to him makes it reasonable that you would present your body as a living sacrifice. But there's so much more. 
See, I had a Sunday school teacher that, um, and this was an adult Sunday school class, but uh, he, he always liked to use the example of a robot that he imagined he could, could create. And he would built it from the ground up, and, and he wanted it to go to the fridge and get him a drink while he was sitting down watching the game because he's too lazy to get up and get it himself. So he says, hey, if I've made this robot and I tell it to go get me a drink and it goes that way instead, I'm probably going to work on it. I might calibrate a sensor and, and try again. And then when it just sputters out in front of me, I'll, I'll work on the programming. And you know, time after time, I'll, I'll try to make it work. But eventually, if it doesn't go to the fridge and get me a drink, I'm going to have a therapy session with a sledgehammer. <laughs> and there will be no more robot. Well, see, God has created you, but more than just creating you because he wanted there to be something, he created you for the purpose of having a relationship with you. He wants those who choose to love him and serve him. And yet he saw that all of his creation and all of mankind who he created to have that relationship with them, that they turned away from him and gone away from him. He saw that their righteousness was nothing but filthy rags. No matter how much that they might try to be worthy of him, they never could be. That their sin made it so that they could not be together anymore. And instead of taking the therapy session with the sledgehammer, instead he left the perfection of his home in heaven to come down to this earth. To be one of us. So as you read through your Bible, sometimes it's good to remember the context of what you're reading. And, and I'm thinking specifically of Isaiah 53. Hopefully we're all familiar with Isaiah 53 and, and the, the suffering servant and saying, you know, when Christ comes, the suffering that he will have. But it's good to keep in mind as you're reading that, that that was written about 750 years before Christ came. You're not reading about somebody who said this is what happened when Christ came, but you have concrete proof that God knew before he came everything that he was going to go through when he came down here, and yet he loved you enough to do it anyhow. Amen. When you read that he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Amen. That's not... Something to just go past, but to know that he understood everything he would have to do for you, and yet he came anyway. When you read in John 19, and it says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Don't just read on, but think about what that meant to be scourged. It wasn't just a bullwick, and it cracked and lacerated. But instead, it would have in the end of it uh, sharp pieces of bone or pottery. And and when they would go and it would hit, it would stick in the flesh and then they would rip it out. And as they go over and over again, hitting the flesh and ripping it out, it wasn't uncommon for the intestines to come out the back of someone who was scourged. Think about what Christ went through for love of you. And then they took the soldiers, plated a crown of thorns, and put it on his head. And you've seen the depictions of the crown of thorns on the head, and um, they're pretty accurate because the thorny bushes in Palestine had thorns that were about that long. And as they put it about his head, they said that they beat him over the head, and this crowny thorn would have then stuck in and popped out in other places as it hits the skull. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. Now, the physical torture that he went through is one thing, but to be the God of the universe who loved these people so much that he left perfection to come down and heal them, and yet they mock him. Sometimes it's a whole lot easier to take a beating than a mocking. And yet Christ did all this for you. And he didn't have to sit there and take it. He didn't have to come in the first place. And in Matthew 26, 53, he tells his disciples, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. 
He didn't have to stay there, but because he loved you, he took that. He was tortured, mocked, and beaten. And then he died for you. In Romans 5, 6 through 8, it says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And when he died for you on that cross, he took the penalty that you could never pay for your sins making it so that you did not have to spend an eternity in hell paying the price for your sins. But God did not just want to save you from hell. God created you for a relationship with you. He wants to be with you. So he didn't just stop at saving you from hell, but just paying a penalty you could never pay. He wants to live with you forever in heaven. So when he rose again the third day, defeating death, hell, and the grave, he did that so that he could spend an eternity in heaven with you. Because he loves you. And 1 Thessalonians 4.14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus Christ will God bring with them. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You have earned none of this. It's cost you nothing, and yet it costs him everything. But God still loved you yet more. Beyond just creating you, and then when he sees that you have fallen, he came down to you and was tortured, mocked, beaten, died. He rose for you to make a place for you in heaven that you could spend eternity with him. But he loves you so much that he doesn't even want you to worry that you might get there. He doesn't want you to worry that you might lose that salvation, but instead he has secured you in your salvation. First Philipp- uh, sorry, first Philippians. It is the first Philippians, but uh, Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will constantly be doing the work of securing you in your salvation. And Ephesians 4 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. John 10, 28, and 29. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So here you can think of yourself in the hand of Jesus. And as you're in there, there is no one who is greater than Jesus. You don't have any neighbor or co-worker or family that mocks you for your faith that could possibly ever do anything to get you out of the hand of Jesus. And even the devil himself is not greater than Jesus and cannot get you out of Jesus' hand. And this happens to be my favorite part. I'm a man. I'm not greater than Jesus to get myself out of his hand. But it goes further than this and it says, My father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So here are you in the hand of Jesus, in the hand of the Father, and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Are you seeing how important you are to God? Now, there is one way that possibly you could lose your salvation. But in John 6, 37 through 39, it says, And all that the Father giveth to me shall come unto me, and him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. This is kind of where I start feeling like a bad used car salesman and say, but wait, there's more. 
As if all this wasn't enough, that he has created a home in heaven with you, for you so that you can live with him forever. He loves you so much he doesn't want to wait for you to get to heaven to live with you, but instead he lives with you now. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So if we look at this over here and we say that we have a pile of all that God has done for us over here and we see that he's created you and and that he sacrificed himself for you, being mocked, tortured, beaten, died for you. He rose again to give you eternal life. He has secured you in your belief. He lives with you now and you see all that he has already done for you. If you want to say, well, that's all great, but... I've got other stuff I want God to do before I can serve him. I've got a promotion at work. I I, I need this thing over here. Or maybe my family has these problems. I I have a loved one who's sick and and, and needs healing. And and I, I just need God to do these things before I serve him. What you're doing is saying what he has already done is not enough. We understand we've got sickness and pain and and bad things and and people that we love in our lives. And it could be easy to turn to that and say, but God, why? But to do that, it turns your back on all the love he has shown for you already. God is not a welfare system that says, hey, just keep giving me a little bit more and then I'll serve you. So the question is, is it reasonable When you look at all that God has done to prove his love for you, all that he has given of himself, not because you deserved it, but because he is good, is it reasonable that you would present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God? Maybe we could ask this a different way. What it would be unreasonable that God could ask of you based on what he has done? Would it be unreasonable for him to ask that maybe you would work in the nursery? I have no idea what problems are in this church, but I know in churches across the country, they're begging people to work in the nursery. (laughs) It would be unreasonable for you to serve in some way like that? I was at a church in Kentucky, and I was talking to a man out in the foyer, and, and he said, oh, sorry, I've got to go. I'm in the nursery. And this man was going and working in the nursery. Would you become a Sunday school teacher or drive a bus? Would that be unreasonable that God would ask you to do something like that? Could it be unreasonable that he would ask you to talk to your family about him? Co-workers, neighbors, strangers? Could that possibly be unreasonable? So when you give yourself a living sacrifice, that means that your life is not your own. There's so many people that go out and they say, well, God never said I couldn't do this, so I'm going to. You know what that means? They're living for themselves, not for the one who gave himself for them. It's all about them and what they can get from God, not about what God deserves for all he has done for them. Just because God didn't say you can't doesn't mean that you don't know what God desires from you. How you can be a better witness and testimony for others. How you can maybe put your brother ahead of yourself and know that, well, while it might be legal for me to do this thing, I have somebody over here I know that struggles with it, and so I won't touch it. Why? Because of all that God did for you. Because you love him for it.
Would you let your children go into the ministry? Unfortunately, I know far too many people who felt called into the ministry, and yet their parents said, oh, no, you can't do that. No, no, that's not a good job, or no, there's too much hurt and pain in that life. And they wanted to keep it for themselves instead of letting God have all the honor and the glory for everything he's done. Many people going to the mission field today that I know that are doing it outside of the will of their family. But for every one that I know that went, I bet you there are at least three that never made it because they didn't have the support. What about you? Would you go into the ministry? So as we started deputation, we thought we were going to be the old people on deputation. And we're still older than some of the others that we meet, but it's not like we thought it was. And we've noticed that God are calling a lot of more seasoned people into the ministry than it seems like he did in the past. We're not the only ones with grandchildren who are going. And I know people in their 60s that God called to, to go to Jordan. It's not just for young people that, hey, you need to give your life to God. But if God calls you now, is it unreasonable that he would ask you to give up what you know and to go to some foreign place or to join a ministry and become a full-time? Would that be unreasonable? So we're not going to the Czech Republic because God broke our hearts for the people there. In fact, we've only spent a few weeks over there and it's not enough time for our hearts just to be melded with them. And I'm sure that we are going to love the people God has called us to. But we are going to the Czech Republic, not because our hearts are broken for the Czech people, but because our hearts are broken for what God has done for us. And when he asked us to go, there, it was just, yes, if that's what you want, that's where we will go. end up with this. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, Paul writes, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So the question you need to answer here today is, is it reasonable that you would present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him? Is that reasonable? Based on everything that God has done for you, are you going to keep living for yourself or are you going to live for him? Maybe you've been here for a while and you've heard the gospel message before that God so loved you that he came down to earth and paid a penalty that you could never pay. And yet you haven't accepted that yet. Hopefully if you're here this morning and, and you have not accepted Christ as your savior and you see how much he loved you, then maybe you will give yourself to him. Maybe there are those here today Oh, you've accepted his gift, but you have not given yourself back in response. Would you do that? We come to preach on missions, but really the, the only thing that you can ever possibly do is say, God, my life is yours to do with as you will. I'm not my own, but I've been bought with a price. That's what the, um, the Galatian churches did when they gave to, to help out the, the ministry in Jerusalem when they had a famine. They gave above what, well, Paul really even thought that they could and said, hey, this is too much. And 
And they said, no, no, you have to take it because by the grace of God, we gave it. And they, this is what Paul said. The reason that they were able to do that is because they gave themselves to God first. That's what we're talking about. Because he has given you everything. And I do mean everything. Life, eternal life, forgiveness. Will you give yourself back in return? Or are you just hoarding your life for you? For what you desire, for what you see? I want my grandkids to do this. Or are they all God's? It's your choice. But I ask you, is it reasonable? Lord, we thank you for how much love you have shown to us. And Lord, um, we think of love in such different terms today than, than this word means in, in, in your word. And Lord, it's not just about some feeling and some gratitude, but Lord, when we see your love, it is a demonstration of how much you care for us by the sacrifice you have made for us. That you don't just have words of love, but you have actions of love. And you've asked us in response that you would act in, in love to you. And so, Lord, I ask that you would just convince people of this truth and that people in this church would give themselves to you. And Lord, I know if they do that, that number one, they will never be sorry that they did. But number two, it will be amazing to see what you would do through them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.